you can take photos like this with a regular DSLR camera, zoom lens and tripod. Hi, I'm Mark from Team Dominator and I'm going to show you how. You'll need a DSLR camera, cropped or full frame is fine, a lens which can be 100mm or longer. If you have a shorter focal length lens like a wide angle, then consider doing Milky Way shots instead using this technique. You'll also need a tripod and a desktop computer. Optional but not required items are a polar tracker if you want to avoid star trails at longer exposures. If your camera doesn't have one built in, then you'll need an intervalometer to trigger the shutter, or else you can trigger it manually. And also a tablet or laptop screen, or an LED flat light panel, which you can use to capture flats during your imaging instead of having to wait till sunrise, which I'll go into later. Although dark skies with little light pollution and no moon are always preferable, it's not required. The images shown previously were taken with a full moon and from Bortle 7 skies, which are classed as suburban city skies. This tutorial is a three-parter. Part one is about how to take the images. Part two uses free tools to process the image into something that's usable. And part three, which is optional, uses tools like Photoshop to refine the image. First thing we need to do is decide what we're going to look at and find it. I've made a list of the brighter targets from the Messier catalog, which are good ones to start with. The targets and seasons listed here are for the Northern Hemisphere. I'm going to use Orion for this tutorial, as it's visible now and for the rest of the winter. You probably already know where Orion can be found in the night sky, but if not, I'll go into that in a minute. Orion consists of four stars with the belt in the middle. The top left star has a reddish color to it and is called Betelgeuse. It's a red supergiant, which if it was at the center of our solar system, would have its surface extend past Mars and the asteroid belt. Good targets in Orion for this approach are M42 and M43, which lie between the belt and the bottom two stars. M42 is the Orion Nebula, and M43 is Damarin's Nebula. And adjacent to the star Altenac, which is the leftmost star in the belt, can be found the Flame Nebula and the Horsehead Nebula. All of these are good targets to start with. If you have a 200mm lens or shorter, you can get all of these in one frame. Over 200mm, you'll want to pick a specific target. Finding stellar objects can be difficult. There are various apps you can download for your mobile phone that will help. These links are my go-tos for finding objects for a particular night at my location. Also, if you're planning your imaging sessions, it's quite useful to be able to use a tool like Clear Dark Sky to determine if your skies are going to be clear or not. Taking good astrophotography photos is all about the signal to noise ratio. We need to maximize the signal and minimize the noise. Luckily the noise is random and the signal isn't. So if you take a number of photos and combine them, the signal will accumulate over time and the noise will average out. This process is called stacking and is integration. On the left is one of the images which we'll call a light frame and on the right is 500 of these images stacked together. I've put together a comparison that shows how powerful stacking is. As the number of shots increase from left to right, you can see the noise in the image decrease and the nebulosity become more defined and brighter. You'll also notice that fainter stars show more as the number of shots goes up. Also the contrast increases. The other trick we use to improve image quality are calibration frames. We use various methods to determine the calibration frames and apply them to each of the individual raw images. Calibration frames remove various sources of errors and noise. Although you can take images without calibration or stacking, the results are much better if you use both of them. Here you can see the difference between a stack of 500 lights with and without calibration. Bias calibration represents the readout noise from the CCD sensor in your camera, and it varies by pixel. It doesn't vary with temperature, but it can vary with ISO. To take a bias frame, you cap the lens and use the fastest shutter. I normally take about 100 bias frames. Every pixel in your camera responds differently to light due to manufacturing differences. This results in some pixels that are hotter or colder than others. 
This is called dark current and is more apparent with longer exposures due to accumulation over time. To take darks, you cap the lens and use the same exposure, shutter speed and ISO. I take 50 dark frames and immediately after the lights so that the temperature is the same as the temperature also impacts the dark current. The final calibration frames we need are flats. These help with optical issues like vignetting, dust and dirt on the lens, and pixel sensitivity. A flat frame will vary with lens, aperture, focal length, and cleanliness. So it's important to take your flats before removing any lenses. To take a flat, you need a uniform source of light. An even source of light you could use could be a tablet, or you could use a dawn or dusk sky. Hang a white t-shirt over the lens and then point it at the light source. You want to expose your flats for about one third to one half on the histogram on your camera. I recommend taking 100 flats. Every camera is slightly different, but here are some guidelines to set up your camera for astrophotography. Because the earth rotates, with long exposures you can get star trails. To avoid this, we use the 500 rule. You take 500 and you divide it by the focal length of your lens. So if your lens is 250 millimeters, 500 divided by 250 equals two seconds. So your exposure for your light frame should be a maximum of two seconds. The 500 rule is just a guideline and you should always zoom into your photo and check that you don't have any star trails before shooting a number of photos. If you still have star trails or elongated stars, then reduce the shutter speed by a stop and try again. Aperture should be set to the widest you can get it so that you get the most light coming onto the sensor. Some cameras have dual native ISOs, so look up the specs for the camera. And if you say have a 100 and a 1600 ISO that are both native, then use a 1600 ISO. You'll need to set your camera to manual exposure and you'll need to expose for the longest shutter speed at which you don't get star trails with the lowest ISO you can. You still want to make sure that you're getting an image on the camera and the camera isn't overexposing. Any in-camera noise reduction or lens correction should be switched off. Your camera should be set to manual focus and all images should be recorded in RAW. It's important that the camera isn't doing any in-camera processing on your images. Finally, make sure auto white balance is switched off and you can do this by setting it to daylight. Because cameras don't handle autofocus well at night, we zoom in and we focus on stars. To get a pinpoint focus, first focus on the brightest stars and then focus on the dimmer stars. To make it easier to remember, here's a table which summarizes this information, which you can print out and take into the field. Another tip when taking light frames is to use your tripod to recenter your subject every 100 frames or so. Because lenses have distortion at the corners, this avoids getting star trails at the corners. So now you have everything to take some awesome photos. In parts two and three, I'll show you how to put these photos together into an awesome picture of the night sky. I'd love to see your astrophotography. Feel free to tag me as Chasing Spin on Twitter or on Facebook. If you like this content, please thumbs up and subscribe. Thank you.